with emergency. I got a call from four people dead. Probably four victims have been shot. Right when four teens were butchered inside their home, the police had no idea who was responsible. Three years later, a guilty conscience pointed the cops in the right direction. This is Christine Paolia, a dorky girl turned beauty queen turned mass murderer. This is the full story of Christine Paolia and how she became a mass murderer. Today's case takes place in Clear Lake, outside Houston, Texas. Well, at Clear Lake High School. Clear Lake High School is home to bright 2,000 students. There were all kinds of sports. Our band was one of the top. But it's also your average teenage drama center. Clear Lake has a tough social hierarchy where some kids are in the in crowd and others are seen as outsiders. In 2003, Rachel Calordius and Tiffany Rowell were best friends, and in many ways they were the classic, popular, good-looking girls. But unlike the many popular girls in the movies, they weren't arrogant or exclusive. In fact, they were two of the kindest people around. Tiffany was an actress with a dream to become a social worker. Tiffany was a very fun person. She was always kind of moving and bubbly and, and talkative. Rachel was passionate about creative arts and wanted to join the Air Force. She was a champion of the underdog and wanted to make a big change in the world, just like her bestie. One such change began when a shy student from New York City joined Clear Lake High School, and Rachel and Tiffany took her under their wing. It was Christine Paolia. Christine had a tough life. She was born on Long Island in 1986 to Lori and Charles Paolia. In 1988, Charles was on a construction site when a bag of bricks fell onto his head, killing him on the spot. I had to go home and tell my children that daddy wasn't coming home anymore. In a very strange turn of events, Charles had hefty life insurance but his two-year-old daughter was listed as his sole beneficiary. She couldn't receive the insurance until she was 18, but neither could her mother. Overwhelmed, Lori became a heroin addict. She lost custody of her children and they moved from relative to relative. Then, when Christine was only five, she woke up and realized her hair was falling out in huge chunks. She would wake up in the morning and there would just be clumps of hair all over her pillow patches here, patches there. She became extremely self-conscious about it. By the time she was in primary school, Christine had lost all of her hair, including her eyebrows and eyelashes. She was diagnosed with alopecia. At such a young age, it was devastating. She started wearing wigs and started being ridiculed at school. Classmates would come up behind her, pull her wig off her head, and. Uh, it became a very big problem. Life at school was downright cruel for Christine. She became a complete outcast. Psychologically, to a young person, this can take a huge toll. Hair is hugely important to, to girls, to women. It's a symbol of femininity. It's a symbol of feminine power. So when she moved to Clear Lake High School, she didn't have her hopes up. But for the first time in her life, Christine would make friends. Christine came home day, very happy. She said, Mom, I said, I made two new friends who are the sweetest girls I've ever met. I said, who are they? She said, oh, Rachel and Tiffany. By now, Christine was living with Lori again. She'd kicked off her addiction and remarried. So when they moved to Clear Lake, they were looking for a fresh start. They found all that and more. Now, Christine had a group of kind, popular friends. But sadly, this was the beginning of the end for Christine. Rachel and Tiffany saw how much Christine looked up to them. So they decided to give Christine a total makeover. They found her a cooler wig and took her to get contact lenses. They gave her makeup tips. And within a few months, Christine was just as sought after. She was voted by the school. 2003, Miss Irresistible, Clear Lake High School. 
they did it because they felt that she was the person who they just loved because of the way she was, the person she was. Christine had gone from a shy social outcast to a reputable high school beauty queen, but things would take a quick downfall from here on out. After Rachel and Tiffany graduated, they weren't hanging out with Christine on a daily basis anymore. Christine was one year younger, still in school, and spending more time with her boyfriend. Back in 2002, Christine befriended another group of people, the bad boys, who smoked reefer behind the school. This is how Christine met Chris Snyder. He was your average maverick, eyebrow piercing and oversized clothing included. He was only 16, but to 14-year-old Christine, she seemed like the father she never had. It's almost like he was a father figure to me because he'd always, you know, said he could take care of me and, and I always had that, you know, in my mind. But Chris wasn't exactly protective. Just a few months into their relationship, he became controlling and abusive. If he didn't get what he wanted, he would do whatever it took to, you know, get me to you know, do something for him. He didn't allow Christine to see her friends and family. This way, he would be her only relationship. At one point, Chris was arrested for armed robbery and sent to prison for a few months. Christine's family tried to convince her to dump him, but when he was released, they were back together. By now, he was simply a bully to her. He'd even pull her wig off in front of her friends. Her worst nightmare. Tiffany and Rachel also told Christine that she should dump Chris, but she didn't listen. That was her first big mistake. After graduating, Rachel and Tiffany moved in together into a small home in Clear Lake and took summer jobs at the same bar. Tiffany was dating Marcus Priscilla, and sometimes his cousin, Edelbert Sanchez, would tag along. The four would chat, play games, and throw parties at the house. Christine began feeling left out from her girls' group. Rachel and Tiffany refused to invite her if she came with Chris. In the late afternoon of July 18, 2003, two neighbors knocked on Rachel and Tiffany's door for a quick surprise visit. No one answered, so they tried the door, and they discovered a blood-chilling scene. It's an emergency. I got a call from four people dead. Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Edelbert had been butchered. Uh, there's blood spatter that's on the walls. There's bullet holes uh, from rounds that have gone into the victims and outside of them. It was much too late to save them. Edelbert was the oldest of the group, aged 21. The other three were only 18. And we had four recently graduated high school kids that were slaughtered. All of them had been shot multiple times, but Rachel had suffered the most horrific death. She'd been hit with a blunt object over her head until her head was practically smashed in. The crime scene was as gruesome as it was eerie. There was no sign of a break-in, and the TV was still playing cartoons. In a truly sad twist, Rachel's hand was still on her phone. She'd dialed 911 one digit away from making the call. There were dozens of shell casings on the floor from two different guns, but there were no weapons found at the scene. The killer had come equipped, and this was a premeditated attack. The investigators now knew they were looking at a minimum of two killers, but they had no idea where to start. The case immediately made headlines all over the country, and when the media showed a picture of the house where it all happened, Rachel's dad, George, recognized the address and headed there as fast as he could. He made a heartbreaking attempt to enter the house, but the police didn't let him. Right, Sir, step behind that white line and go to the right hand. All right? Please. Please. Please, Dad. I know. Oh. I know. Please. Oh. Imagine learning that your daughter is dead but not being able to come in and say goodbye. As the police interviewed the group of friends, they learned that Rachel and Tiffany would host parties almost daily. But on July 18th, they were by themselves at home, watching TV. However, one neighbor reported a crucial detail. They'd seen a young man and a woman walking down the street that day. They both wore black and the woman was described as pretty, 
with big eyes and wearing a black bandana. This is her portrait drawn by forensic artist Lois Gibson. The sketches were released all over the country, hoping for a helpful call. But weeks turned to months and no one came through. Then the police started looking at Marcus. He used to be a dealer, so they were wondering if the murderers had been a deal gone wrong. But several friends and relatives of Marcus said that he was really trying to change his ways, and he didn't have any enemies at the time. There was another clue that dismissed this theory. If this was a deal gone wrong, then drugs or money would have disappeared from the house that day. But everything was left intact, bar the four people that were inside. As the police continued debating theories, they decided to look at the four bodies. Of the four, Rachel had been attacked the most. Her head had been smashed in and she'd been shot in the crotch. A forensic psychiatrist suggested this may be a sign of sexual envy. It seemed like the police were close, but they had no idea who would want Rachel dead so badly. One year later, the case made headlines again, only because there were zero leads. People were angry and um, afraid. Nobody knew who did this. It was, you know, young kids in the middle of the day in a nice neighborhood. Christine seemed affected too. She was very upset. She cried most of the night. Did she stay home? She slept in our bed for three nights. She was afraid. Christine's parents supported her through this grieving period and even Clear Lake students offered their sympathy for losing her two best friends in such a horrific matter. No one saw her as a suspect. In 2004, she was arrested for shoplifting. That's when she entered a rehab program and broke up with Chris. During rehab, Christine met Justin, a fellow former heroin addict. Their relationship was just as intense as Christine's first relationship. Within a year, they got married. And remember how Christine had a huge insurance waiting for her when she turned 18? Christine spent a staggering $360,000 on a brand new apartment, and the rest on heroin. It was July 8, 2006. Almost three years had passed since the horrific murders. Houston police had declared it a cold case, and they did not expect to receive a phone call about it. A man who had been at the same rehab program as Christine told the police he'd heard her brag about committing the 2003 murders. As far as the police knew, Christine, Rachel, and Tiffany were BFFs. They had even found a photo of Christine in Rachel's purse. But when they looked at the profile sketch again, they realized it did resemble Christine. And when they found out she had alopecia and was usually wearing wigs, the bandana made all the more sense. So the police paid Christine and Justin a visit. Their apartment was filled with clutter and syringes. Well, it was filled with everything, but Christine and Justin. Christine had seen her face on TV that summer and panicked. Then the couple left in a hurry to hide in a drugs motel, just like in the worst Breaking Bad scenes. On July 19th, 2006, Christine was arrested at the motel. And Justin? Well, he was the one who made the call to the police. You see, when Christine saw her face on TV, she confessed everything to Justin. Inside the interrogation room, she could barely sit up straight. At the time, she told the cops that she was used to shooting up every 10 to 15 minutes. She told the detectives she and her ex-boyfriend Chris had gone to the house to take their drugs and money, but things took a sudden turn and Chris started shooting people. Then she got sick and the police transported her to a hospital. When they interrogated her later that day, her story changed. So the gun was in your hand, and what was he telling you? One, two, three? I, he, was, he was holding on to it, too. OK, like on top of your hand or something? Yes. Christine claimed that Chris forced her to shoot her friends, as he was controlling as always. I had made the, the gun go off, not not purposely, though, but like it, it went to the, like, the back of the room, because I was just like screaming, just like shaking. How many times do you think it went off in your hand? A million times. It went off a bunch in your hand? It, it felt like a million times. Then I, I heard, like, like I, I heard, like, shots, but but it wasn't from my gun. It was or the one that, that he gave me. How could a gun go off in your hand a million times? And if that somehow happened, how did she hit all her victims so well? They all had been shot in the head and chest. Everyone knows those are the lethal spots. 
and when Justin was questioned, he remembered Christine telling a different story. Christine was jealous of Rachel and Tiffany. She and Chris knew that they were going to attack them. They didn't know two boys would also be there, but they didn't care. They were set to kill. In one gruesome final clue, Justin said Christine saw Rachel barely alive after the shooting, so she moved closer to her and made sure she was dead. The police found Chris Snyder in a forest. He'd taken his own life after a family member told him the police were looking for him. In 2008, Christine went on trial. Justin's confession, the lack of drugs or money taken from the house, and her long-standing jealousy of Rachel and Tiffany painted a clear picture. She was convicted on all four counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 40 years before parole. If Christine is on her best behavior, she will be out in 2046 at the age of 60. But can she ever atone for taking four innocent lives and killing the friends that once helped her blossom? And will the victims' families ever forgive her? Thanks for watching, you guys. Don't forget to leave a comment, like, and subscribe. And why not hit that bell button so you never miss a new episode? See you next time and stay safe.